All right, I'm delighted to present our next speaker. So the next part of our intensive is on evaluating your novel model. And uh, this is a important part of the research process, so much so that we have not one, but two speakers for this upcoming lecture. This one will be done jointly by Elaine Liu and Xiao Liang. So without any further ado, take it away. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our evaluating your novel model section of our intensive. So my name is Elaine and my um, my partner Sally and I have the great honor today to be walking through this very exciting lecture. So imagine once you have trained your novel model, uh, think back to Kathy's lecture. So you are actually fine tuned the pre-trained Albeth model there. Model evaluation is a very important process of using different evaluation metrics on your test set to understand a machine learning model's performance, as well as its strengths and weaknesses. So in my opinion, model evaluation is one of the most important steps to assess the efficacy of our model during our initial process, research process, as well as just keep monitoring your model performance when you, after you have deployed your model. So today we're actually going to continue after what Kathy have taught you, um, just, which is fine tuning on Albeth model. We're actually going to go through a practical example of evaluating Albeth model's performance on one of its downstream data tasks. And as you, if you have read the Albeth paper, then you should be very familiar with the model. But if you haven't, it's okay. I just dropped the link to the paper below. Feel free to take a look afterwards. We're also going to recap some of the important architecture of this model in a little bit. But one of the more important reasons why Albeth from the Salesforce research team um, has been very influential since it came out is because it actually achieves state-of-the-art downstream tasks performance on a lot of vision language tasks, including image text retrieval, VQA, and NLVR. And the authors actually ran different experiments and compared Albef with previous state-of-the-art models in the vision language domains. So here, this is the table from the Albef paper's results section. So in this table, the authors are showing Albeth's zero-shot image to text retrieval results on the Flickr 30K dataset. So if you don't know Flickr 30K, it's a dataset that contains image and caption pairs. And here, zero-shot image to text retrieval is one of the classic visual language tasks. I'm also going to review this task in the next section. But I want you to just first focus on this table here to see how the authors are presenting their results. So first, they're showing the two variations of the Albeth model, one trained on the 4 million image, uh, images and the other one trained on 14 million images. So by showing this, so first of all, it's really impressive results in terms of image retrieval and text retrieval. But not only that, it's also showing that the model performance also scales with the size of their data set. And then, while it's at the same time, the authors are also comparing all this for performance with three other street of the art visual language models, including Uniter, Clip, and Align. And not only that, the author also emphasized that Albef actually outperforms these methods that are pre trained on the same kind of sized data set or on orders of magnitude larger data sets. So, this is also showing that the Albef model is very data efficient. So after we have talked about our motivating example from the Albeth paper, let's look at the learning outcomes today. So after attending this lecture, you'll be able to first load the Albeth model checkpoint and inference on their test data set and reproduce some of their test set results, which is very exciting. We're going to do this in a Google Colab notebook. And secondly, you're going to compute a metric and its confidence intervals from the test set predictions using the bootstrap method. And thirdly, you are going to uh, have, gain a basic understanding of other types of classic classification and lang natural language generation metrics for model evaluation, just in case you want to build your other machine learning models in the future. 
And here's the agenda. So there are three main sections to this lecture. In the first section, we're gonna do a live coding to implement the evaluation pipeline of OBEV. The second part, we're gonna introduce confidence intervals and give you some tips and methods to compute confidence intervals for your own um, model metrics. And thirdly, my partner Sally is gonna introduce you and talk more about other kinds of metrics you could use in the future. So let's dive right into our first section, which is example evaluation pipeline for all best image text retrieval process. And now I think I want to first recap the Albeth model architecture first. So this diagram is showing you the model architecture of Albeth. Don't be intimidated by the information here. We're gonna break it down a little bit. So Albeth stands for align the image and text representations before fusing. So I want you to first pay attention to the bottom part of the model where they have two separate encoders, the image encoder and the text encoder. So once we have these image text pairs, we're gonna first pass the images through the image encoder and the text through the text encoder and then encode them into vector representations. And then we're going to apply a contrastive loss objective on the bottom part, uh, vector representations. This is kind of the first loss that Albeth uses. And then we're going to kind of pass through the vector representations of the image and the text to the top part, multi-model encoder. So here, this is just um, another sixth layer of the bird encoder, which is actually performing cross-model attention between the image and the text so that we are actually fuse, fusing information from the image modality and the text modality. And then we are going to use the multi-model output to compute an image text matching score. So this image text matching score is gonna describe you on how well this image and text match. Um, so I hope, and there's another objective, which is the mass language modeling objective. So this is done in a very similar way to BERT. And due to time, I'm not gonna go through in detail today, but feel free to read more in the paper later on. So one of the downstream tasks I talked about that Albeth was able to perform very well in is image text retrieval. Image text retrieval involves understanding both the vision and language domains with appropriate matching strategies. So think about this, if we're given an image, so the model's job here is really to fetch the topmost relevant test description from a larger pool of descriptions. Here's an example. There's a picture of a man scratching his head. This is a real picture from the Flickr 30K dataset. And now imagine you have this, like an arbitrary number of descriptions to choose from. If your test set is say a thousand samples, then you would have like, you know, many thousands of these descriptions to choose from. And the model's job to, to, is to pick the descriptions that best describe the image which hopefully is our ground truth caption for this image, a green man in a suit is perplexed at a business meeting. And if the model is gonna be able to retrieve that, then that's a success. So how does Albeth do this? So just recap that we talked about, Albeth first feed the image and text to the multi-model, uh, uni-model encoders at the bottom. So once you are giving an image, you would uh, put that into the, through the image encoder and then you would put off the possible, you know, test candidate, text candidates to the text encoder so that you are, you can compute the cosine similarity scores using the union model outputs. And then you're going to select the top K candidates using the cosine similarities between these images and text. And you're going to only going to keep and then going to take a look at the top K of them. So if, if you have a hundred tests, captions, you're actually going to, if k equals to 30, then you're only going to look at the top, top 30 and ignore the rest of the captions. And then you would put the captions and the image through the multi-encoder, multi-model encoder for them to perform cross-model attention and then compute the image text matching score. So hopefully among the 30k captions you chose from the first step, you'd be able to retrieve, um, rank their image text matching scores for the retrieval process. Now you get a big picture understanding of how Albef image text retrieval works. I just want you to have this big picture in your head and I'm gonna go right into the coding section. 
So a lot of the code in this notebook is going to be adapted from um, the Albert repo. Um, my partner Sally is going to drop the link to the collab look notebook in the chat. Let me also go to my. <laughs> so first, uh, this is the notebook I wrote for you. And this is um, part of this actually um, very similar to what Kathy just talked about in her model training process, but we're going to focus on the evaluation and inferencing part. I'm going to do some setup first. These steps are not super uh, important to understand for now, but I'm just simply mounting my Google Drive to my notebook and I'm seeding into my working directory that contains all the all the um, repo that I cloned from GitHub. And I'm gonna install some dependencies. Now, uh, if you go to the Albeth repo link, you will see these kind of requirements on their readme read page. So after this intensive, you want to run this model yourself, you would have to go through these steps, cloning the repo and downloading the dependencies and make sure your drive is set up properly. Oh, yes, sorry. Gonna increase my font size. Sorry, did not notice that. Is this good? And here I'm just importing some dependencies, some functions from Python, some packages from Python, as well as some function from the Albeth repo, uh, such as data loader and um, the Albeth model itself, so that I can use it in my evaluation pipeline later on. So now we are going to create our test set. So the original Albeth image text retrieval text test set contains around a thousand samples. However, due to the computation limit on Colab uh, and also our time limit, I don't have time to really do inference on a thousand image samples. So I'm actually just going to load uh, the original test JSON file and I'm going to sample 10% uh, of the data set, which I'm going to use just use a hundred of them as a dem for demonstration purposes. But if you're interested to reproduce um, the results in their paper and you have the computation power, later on, feel free to try that with the original test file. I'm loading the retrieval uh, configurations. This contains some important info uh, model information, also batch size information uh, I'm going to have to use later on in my evaluation process. And now the third section is about preparing your, your test data set. As you can see, I actually adopted this tra tra test transform function from the original repo. This just shows you um, a few steps that the authors used when they are pre-processing test set data. So they're doing a resize first so that it's at the same resolution size as it's the, the training images. And it's also uh, putting to tensor and normalizing it using the mean and the standard deviation of the training data set. The idea is that you don't want your test set to be on like a com completely different kind of data distribution. This is for um, consistent model performance. And the re-eval retrieval set, which stands for retrieval eval data set, is also um, what I imported from the Albeth repo. More details of this function can be found on the, on the GitHub page. And here I'm creating a data loader for my test data set. And you, this test data loader is going to help me load up my captions for the images and also my test set images later on uh, in the evaluation process. Here, yeah, I just want to show you quickly how what kind of captions are actually in the test data. So you can see if we um, load up the text, so you, um, there are captions such as two men sitting on a car being drawn by a horse down a cobblestone street, or a young Asian man playing her, his respects. These are just captions for the test images we have in the data set. And now the fourth part is about defining the model. Because you would have to pass your test set images and text through uh, the Albeth model, you have to define Albeth model and actually load a pre-trained checkpoint. So here, if you look back to my configuration, I'm actually using the Albeth 4 million path checkpoint that I downloaded from the original GitHub repo. Uh, you can feel free to download this or the 14 million checkpoint for, for your own experiment later. And now I am defining the tokenizer I would have to use for my model, which is a pre-trained bird tokenizer. 
and also building the model from scratch. So here I'm calling the orbit function I just imported from the repo and building my orbit model um, by inputting the configurations uh, and tokenizer information. And importantly, I'm using a pre-trained checkpoint. So this step, you would have to load in whatever checkpoint that you want to evaluate on. So if you have further fine-tuned the model, you probably have to um, alternate this path. But here, I'm just using the publicly available checkpoint here. And now we built the tokenizer in our model for later use. This is going to take a while. So. And the next part is probably the focus of our um, notebook today which is the evaluation mechanism. So evaluation me mechanism is going to take in the model, the tokenizer, the data set we just defined above, and then do all the process we just talked about in our slides uh, to calculate image text matching scores so that we can get a ranking of, you know, for each image which text matched the best with the image. And then we kind of retrieve those captions as our predictions. And these are a few functions I defined, but uh, let's just scroll, scroll all the way down to look at the evaluate function first. So evaluation taking uh, all the things I just specified above and it's at its first step, it's encoding the text with the Unimodel text encoder. So we're retrieving our text from our data loader and then we're putting our text as so our model and tokenizer into this Unimodel text encoder function which is actually gonna help you, you know, encode your model like the at, the at the bottom part of the model that we just talked about. And if we scroll up for a little bit, so I can show you a little bit more of the detail of this function. So this function is simply, you know, this function is calling the model text encoder, which is simply the first six layer of BERT that we just went through. And we can look and the model is going to be able to output you know, text embedding of the CLS token for the, uh, for the text sentence, also text features for the entire sentence, as well as attention masks we're using for each, uh, each sentences. And next step is pretty similar, but we're doing it for the text images. So we're encoding the images with our Unimodel image encoder, which is actually a vision transformer. So this function, similarly to the text, we're taking our um, test data loader so that we can load the images one by one in our data loader and then encode them using the visual encoder specified in the ALBEF model uh, to get our image features. And similarly, we could get the embedding of our image CLS token. Uh, which is this image embed here. And now we have done th gone through the bottom part of the model, which is the Unimodel encoders. We would then compute the cosine similarities that we just talked about, because we would have to first look like which K pairs of texts and image have, are having the highest cosine similarity score. So we can filter out the rest of the text that doesn't seem to match well with the data at all uh, in our first part of the pipeline. So we would compute the similarity matrix by taking out a product of the image features and the text features. So by taking a product out a product of their embedding matrices, we'll be able to get the closing similarities between each image and text pair possible in our test data set. And after we have our closing similarity matrix, then we would feed um, the similarity matrix as well as mm, its uh, embedding or the original text uh, embeddings into our uh, function sims to i2 image to text matching score function. So this function here is taking in the image features, text features to perform cross model attention and then um, output the image to text matching score here. So this is this function I defined here. Um, Basically, the first part of the function is that it's looking at its cosine similarity score. So for a given image, it's looking at the cosine similarity score between the image and all the text captions and only selecting the top K captions um, out of um, all of the test set captions. And then we are feeding into these texts and the image into the multi-model encoder to perform cross-model attention through the last six layers of the BERT model. 
And then we are going to put the output of our model model embedding through a fully contacted layer, which is named ITM head here to get the image text to text ITM score that we talked about in our slides. And now we'll be able to output our final prediction score, which is called score matrix image to text. So this matrix is going to have the number of rows of this matrix is going to have it's going to be the same. Sorry, let me just run these cells. I realized I wasn't running these cells while I was talking to you. Uh -huh. OK, and now we're going to get the scores from our. Um, so each row of the score matrix corresponds to a test sample. And the columns corresponds to all the possible captions in the test set uh, data. And then we, and then each cell just contains the image to text matching score between the image and the corresponding captions. And to evaluate, we simply have to call the evaluate function. And then you input your model, your data loader, your tokenizer, your configurations into uh, this function to compute your final image to text matching scores that you are going to use for ranking later. And while this is computing, uh, this is gonna it, it's gonna take around a minute or two. Um, it's, it depends on Colab's server availability. Sometimes there are gonna be an input issue here, just because I think Colab server server and Google Drive server is actually separate. So because my images are all stored in my Google Drive, so sometimes Colab has a little bit of a problem reading all my images, especially when the number of files exceeds fifty files. But if that happens, you just have to rerun the cell and it should solve the problem. And before we, uh, while we're running this function, computing features for evaluation, let's look at ITM eval function. So this ITM eval function is gonna to take your image to text matching scores that hopefully tells you how well a caption described the image and then rank them. Uh, here, the ranks function, uh, you can try, you can kind of go through this line by line by yourself after the, this intensive. But the higher level idea here is that it is the ranks function has the same length as the test sample. So if the test sample has 100 samples, the ranks function has length 100. And then here we're retrieving the highest rank of the image to text scores that corresponds to ground truth image text pair. So for example, if for image one, um, your highest image to text score actually corresponds to the ground truth caption, then your rank would be zero. And then if it doesn't, you'd be which, at whichever rank you can find the ground truth caption. If it's the third rank score that corresponds to ground truth, then the rank here will be three. And to compute a recall at K metric here, they're defining the metric at, you know, if you look at top K image to text matching scores, whether uh, if it contains the ground truth, then uh, recall at K would be one, and if it doesn't, zero. So here you just have to simply take the number of uh, samples with ranks smaller than one divided by the total number of samples to get the R at one metric. And similarly, the idea applies to R at five, R at 10. Oops, yeah. Yeah, this, this error sometimes occurs. Well, it computes again. Uh, I don't think we have time to wait for that, but I am gonna come back to this notebook and show you the output later. But here, this is some of the metrics I pre-computed for you. Uh, R at one is 94, R at five is 100, R at 10 is 100. If we go back to our table here, you would imagine you would take a look at the text retrieval scores on the Focus 30K. There are some variations to the the performance reported. This is because we're only using 10% of the test data while their total test size is a, a thousand. And this kind of leads me to my next point. So when you are doing model evaluation, and a lot of papers might only uh, uh, report this point metric, which is just one number. But in reality, if your test set changes a little bit or if your test training split changes a little bit, you're probably going to see a slightly different results. And usually this is not a huge problem if your deep learning or machine learning model is using a huge test data set, because when, you know, the basic idea of confidence interval is that the, the more number of some larger the number of samples, the narrower the confidence interval. 
But if you are only using a hundred test set, like we just show, show, showed you, oh, let's finish the evaluation. If we just showed you in our demo here, you're probably gonna see a lot of variability in your test metric performances. And then if you sample, you know, a different set of um, 100 samples, you're probably gonna see a different number from this. Um, let's also save our scores because we're gonna use this in the next part of the demo. So that's why confidence intervals come into play. But before I dive deeper into confidence intervals, um, I want to first kind of introduce the concept of co uh, confidence intervals a little more in depth. So I think it's usually a pretty often misunderstood concept. So a confidence interval is a range of estimates for an unknown parameter represents the long run proportion of corresponding confidence intervals that contain the true value of the parameter. So for example, here, the, uh, look at the graph on the bottom. So here are all the confidence intervals um, computed from the same metric. But out of all intervals computed at the 95% level, 95 of them should contain the parameter's true value, while 5% of them are, don't contain the, value, uh, the parameter's true value. So if you hear someone who says, you know, if you have a 95% confidence interval, there is 95% probability that the true value lies in your interval. That is a false statement. Uh, hmm? no, okay. So here is just another example. So on the on the top, you are you, you see this normal distribution with mean mu um, and that, at the top. And then you if you take 20 different data samples from this normal distribution and then kind of compute the confidence for the sample mean. So the, the sample mean is denoted by the diamond symbol here, and this confidence interval is denoted by the colored lines here. You would realize actually at a 50% confidence interval, only 50%, 50, you know, half of these rows would add confidence intervals would contain the true parameter value mean. So why should we compute confidence intervals for our machine learning model in this case then? So like I said, um, in reality, you know, especially I think if you're using in the medical domain, uh, developing good predictive models hinges upon accurate performance, evaluate, uh, ev performance evaluation comparisons. However, we typically have to work around a lot of constraints, especially in the medical domain. We our data, data is very, very scarce. And then sometimes we cannot afford to have like thousands of test samples um, for our models. So confidence intervals cannot solve all the problems, but at the very least, they can offer an additional glimpse into the uncertainty of the reported accuracy or other metrics um, for your model. So I think this is just a very good practice when you, as a machine learning practitioner or researcher, when you're writing your paper, you can um, include your confidence interval. This can really greatly enhance the communication of your research results, as well as impact the reviewing process as well. So you might ask, how do we compute confidence intervals? I think we're gonna, there are four different methods in uh, if you are a machine learning researcher. I think we're only gonna focus on the first two, but I'm just putting everything here. The first method is I think probably the method that a lot of people might be familiar with, which is a normal approximation interval based on a test set. So this uses the good kind of confidence interval formula I'm showing in this, uh, in this slide, ci equals x bar plus minus z times s divided by square root n. So this is a confidence interval you would compute if your statistic is normal and then you're trying to compute uh, the, the, the confidence intervals for your sample mean. However, like I mentioned, if you want to use this, you have to, you need a one very important assumption is that that your statistic actually follows a normal distribution, and this assumption is usually satisfied if you are computing the mean of a measurement variable and then you have enough data samples, due to the blessing of our good old central limit theorem. So, for example, if you are computing the test set accuracy you can most likely use a normal approximation if you have something like greater than 30 test samples. Because if you're computing the accuracy, you can view each test sample inference as a Bernoulli trial. And your accuracy here is basically 
and the proportion of success in your Bernoulli trial. And the accuracy would actually be just an estimate of uh, the parameter P, which stands for proportion of success in the Bernoulli distribution. So here we can comfortably use the normal approximation method. Like I said, the formula is just simply um, x bar plus minus z times the standard error of the sample mean, which is, con uh, which is computed by dividing the sample standard deviation by number of, uh, by the sample size. And for your accuracy, because it follows, like we said, a Bernoulli distribution, you can compute its variance using accuracy times one minus n, one minus accuracy divide. And then you just simply have to divide it by n and then take a square root to get this uh, standard error shown um, on the right-hand side of z. And then for confidence interval, then you can compute your confidence in interval using the formula shown below. So this is very simple and very, very fast if you, and because it doesn't require you to retrain your model and it doesn't require you have a different test set. But real life is not always this simple because a lot of times when we're evaluating our machine learning models, we're not using accuracy as a metric. Like just now I was using like recall at K and then other times you might be using AUC or F1. And these kind of metrics, uh, you cannot be sure that what kind of distribution they follow. And then you can't, uh, you, you can't make sure they are following, there's any nomadi assumptions in your test metrics. What can you do? But gladly we have our old friend bootstrapping that comes in to help. And usually when you are not sure about the distribution of your test metrics, you can most likely use the bootstrapping method to help you. And Xiaoli also went, uh, went through with the bootstrapping method yesterday in her first lectures in model compress comparison. But let's do a quick recap here. So bootstrapping is any test or metric that uses random sampling with replacement. And the key idea here is that if we have a test sample that is representative of hopefully our true population, and, and then if we just resample from our test set samples with replacement, hopefully it also produces representative samples of this true population. And then if we do this resampling process multiple times or enough times, then our metric values computed from the resampled data is gonna approximately resemble the true metric distribution. So we can just simply use this empirical method to compute our 95% confidence intervals as an example. We're going to do this in real life code, coding example later on, but let me just go through the steps here for you. So first, we have to choose a number of bootstrap samples to perform. Usually we choose to do bootstrapping around, repeat this procedure for around a thousand times. And then we also have to choose a sample size you wanna use. And I think it's a common practice that you just keep the sample size the same as your test sample size. And for each bootstrap sample, you wanna draw a sample from the test set predictions with replacement with the chosen size. And then you would compute your metric. It could be F1, it could be AUC, it could be recall on the predictions, on the resampled predictions. And then once you have done this enough times, you can compute confidence levels by looking at the empirical percentiles of the metrics. This might be a little bit abstract, so let's put this into code. Um, Sally, can you also drop this in the chat? I wrote this in another notebook, so I think it's a bit easier for you to follow through and then take a look. So again, here I need to mod my Google Drive, prepare my working directory. So here, remember, just now we saved um, our model predictions, which is the image test test matching scores, like the zero shot image text retrieval scores into a CSV file. Hopefully this is fine. Save and build things two, three, three. I don't know what this means. Hopefully we're gonna be okay. So we're actually gonna generate the predictions we just saved to our outputs folder. I'm gonna type in the scores for you. So the shape of the scores is 100 times 500. 
So I hundred this because we have a hundred images in our test set. I have five hundred because we have five hundred total captions in our test set because each image in the Flickr thirty kdata data set corresponds to five grant truth captions. And just for the restriction, let me print one of them, please. You will notice that uh, it, this is the scores for the first image. As an example, most of these cells are going to be negative 100 because remember that we are ignoring, you know, whatever captions that didn't make into the top K cosine similarities at, at our first step. So we're actually, and the K I actually set as 32. So the model actually only computed 32 image to text matching scores for each image samples. Okay, clear. Let me just clear. And next, we want to load in our ground truth uh, image to text um, that labels. So that's why I am loading the data set again uh, for ground truth labels in, in the Flickr 30K data set stored as a dictionary format. So the key of the dic dictionary corresponds to the index of your test image. And each image corresponds to five ground truth fact uh, captions. And it's, it's, they are storing this as uh, a list as the value of the dictionary. King. And now this is just a evaluation function that I actually copied from the other notebook that you just saw before, where it's computing the ranks um, using image to text scores. So I'm not going to go through this again. And to simplify things, I'm only going to look at or at one metric because I don't want to complicate you with too many metrics here. And now it comes to the important part. Here I'm defining my bootstrap function. You can see that this function will randomly sample with replacement from the score predictions we are feeding into the function, as well as the, late, the ground truth labels corresponding to these predictions. And then we're going to evaluate n sample times and to obtain you know, our desired test set matrix for each. And here I'm just doing a simple for loop sampling and then retrieving the sampled labels and sampled ground truth values and feeding that into the image to text matching evaluation function. And here I'm dividing and defining and compute confidence interval function. So let's just try to run the bootstrap. Eval is not defined. Let me define this function. Okay, now. To compute our bootstrap statistics, I simply call it bootstrap function. So this is going to perform bootstrap for a thousand times so we can get kind of uh, a thousand different R at one metrics just using kind of different resamples. And here I'm just printing the top 10 for you to, for you to have a look. You can see there are some variations here. And because we're doing this a thousand times, we can assume that or like we, this approximately will give you the distributions of your test metric. So now we define the compute confidence interval function. We are simply taking in the bootstrap metrics and then you're simply looking at, you know, the per different percentiles. So if you want the 95% confidence interval, you can simply look at the 2.5th percentile and the 97.5th percentile to get your lower and upper bound for your confidence interval. And let's try this. So here, uh, your confidence interval is around 88 to 98. You can see there, kind, this is kind of a big range and it's not strange because we only have a hundred samples. And when you only have a hundred samples, usually your confidence interval can be pretty wide. So that's, it's very important for you to get a sense of this because if you're observing like 98%, it could just be happening by chance not because your model is the state of the art. So I think uh, we should be aware of that. Well, what did I hear? <laughs> Just want to switch back to my slides. So now you have a good understanding of the two important methods that we usually use in deep, deep learning. Method three and method four are not commonly used because method three is about bootstrapping the training sets and then retraining the model multiple times. And method four is about um, we're training our model with different random seeds. And you, as we all know that deep learning models usually take a lot of resources and time to train. So we usually don't, it's not practical to do three and four. So I think the biggest takeaway is just method and one and two here, and that should be good to use in most of the scenarios in our research process. Now we have concluded the first two sections. I'm very happy to 
be passing this presentation to my partner, Sally, to be talking to you more about different evaluation metrics that you might come across in the future. Thank you so much, Elaine. Okay, uh, so hello, everyone. Good afternoon for those on the East Coast and good morning for those on the West Coast. Here I am again. <laughs> for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, happy to see you again. Okay, so Elaine has done most of the heavy lifting. She has covered a lot of really solid content. So I won't be making your life harder. So in the following one section, I will be covering some um, metrics that probably some of you have already learned, but hopefully will be a great review. So for example, recall that Elaine has just covered a motivating example on the image text retrieval, but there are a lot more downstream tasks possible. For example, suppose that in another task, uh, we are working on a report generation model. And uh, from this, we accept a input text x-ray image and we generate a report. And we would like to evaluate the quality of our generated reports against the real chest reports produced by doctors. So what are some metrics you can use? There are probably multiple candidates you may suggest, but the metric today we're going to look at is called blue. It's widely used and uh, it's fast to compute. So we'll start with this. The main idea of uh, using blue is that first we start off with a source. In our example, this source is our chest X-ray image. And then we input this image into our model and generate a report, which is re referred as generation. Then we probably compare it with several references. In our case, we may only have one real report, but in some other cases, we may have several. And then we try to come up with a single score to evaluate its quality of our generation. So to make things really, really simple, we will be, go over, we will be going over really dumb examples in this section. For example, we have a piece of generated text called I have one big apple, but our true label is I have a big apple. How do we evaluate the extent of alignment between these two pieces? One intuitive way to, that may come across your mind is that, okay, I just look at how many words they have in common. If uh, two pieces of text already have a lot of words overlapped, then it's very likely is of uh, high quality already. So we can first start off with counting the number of word matches and then divide it by the number of words in our original sentence, in our generated sentence. So in this example, the overlapped words are I have big apple and we missed one. We missed a uh by replacing it with a one. So we missed that word. So in this case, we can say, okay, we will assign a score of four over five, which is 0 0.8. Then one problem that may arise is that, okay, so number of words in generation is fixed, is five words in our case. Then how can I improve my scores blindlessly without any efforts? Say, if I have known that uh, I have, uh, if I have known that I have uh, high confidence that I, this word I, will appear in the true answer, then I just blindly fill out my sentences with all of the eyes. Then I can increase my number of word matches to straight to five. And I have my precision five over five equals to one. That, but that doesn't make sense. We want to fix this problem because a sentence consisting of five eyes is not useful at all. So how do we come, uh, come get, uh, overcome this problem? Here comes the definition of n-grams. So basically, n grams refers to a chunk of consecutive n words. You can interpret it like a window with less n, and we want to roll it to the right gradually, word by word, and check for any word matches. So, uh, sorry about that. Oh, sorry, I uh, I daydream. So uh, to solve the problem of uh, re repeated eyes. Another uh, one more straightforward way is that uh, I want to limit the number of 
eyes eye count in my final result. For example, if I already have only one eye in the references, you cannot get more rewards by having more eyes uh, in that generation. So for example, if I have two eyes in my references uh, sentence, then I will at most count two eyes in my generation. Having three eyes will not add any more metric values to uh, my final score. So this is called clipping your number of word matches according to the number of your uh, true words in the reference text. Okay, then we come to the problem of n-grams that solves. Suppose that, okay, I have checked all of the uh, maxis number of matches I can have from my references to avoid the repetitive I problem or apple problem, then I, there's another loophole I can get around. For example, let's take a look at the generation sentence on the left. It says, I, apple, one, big half. This is clearly a nonsense sentence, although it has exactly the uh, same words as our previous generative sentence, but it has permuted, permuted the words around. We definitely do not want to accept this kind of sentence as our answer because it even does not obey the gram grammar. However, the problem with our current uh, approaches is that it still produce a uh, score of 0 0.8 because we only look at words individually and count the matches. We want to solve this problem by the rolling windows we introduced as n-grams. So how does this work? Let's consider two-gram windows at first. By two-gram, uh, we can consider looking at word, uh, con two consecutive words at the same time. For example, we first take I, apple together and we try to look for a match uh, of it in the references. And we see in the references we have, I have does not match, have a does not match. And we keep rolling to the right and there's no match. And then we didn't find match, we go to the next window. We look at apple one and we repeat the process by starting from the top and there's no match. Again, no match for one big and no match for big half. So we give up. In this way, it makes more sense because we didn't find any match for the two word window and uh, we may say, okay, this is not a good sentence. That's, uh, that makes the whole uh, metric makes more sense. So after looking at uh, the idea behind blue, how blue works, we can see it has uh, two strands. For example, it's really fast and easy to calculate because the only thing you need to worry about is to get the correct number of matches and compute it correctly. And also it's very ubiquitous, uh, it's used widely in a lot of NLP methods. And uh, so it's easy for you to compare your model if you use the same metric. However, there are a lot of limitations as well. For example, it does not consider meaning. As we indicated uh, in our previous example as well, for example, we have one reference uh, sentence on the right, which is I ate an apple. And we have our generated sentence on the left, which is I ate one apple. From our perspective, these sentences are similar enough to be counted as uh, equivalent. However, blue will not consider that as equivalent because one and I, uh, one and an are not same words. So they do not match. We miss out a good matching in this case. And the second one is blue does not directly consider sentence structure. Below is a very uh, classic example that uh, a lot of models that use uh, blue scores actually produced really great blue scores, but really awkward uh, generated sentences. This sentence goes like this. Olajuela appeared calm as he was led to the American plane which would take him to Miami, Florida. First of all, this is a long sentence that adds to its complexity. And also it has complex, a complicated syntax structure. And what is more, it adds even more nuances because it can have multiple interpretations. For example, you can interpret as he was led to the American play as because he was led to the American play. And you can also interpret as Orihela appeared calm when he was led to the American plane. So uh, blue cannot 
um, capture this kind of level of details. So you, sometimes you just perform awkward and uh, give high scores to bad sentences. And here is another more simple example. Uh, we will, well, you won't go there, will you? And you will go there, won't you? Are two sentences with completely the completely opposite meanings. But uh, for blue, it may appear just too similar to each other that they may have similar scores. Finally, uh, according to some behavioral tests, uh, people have shown that the correlation between high blue scores and high human alignment uh, is not always very strong, really depending on specific task. So when you want to apply blue in your research, just try to make sure that you understand its drawbacks as well as strength to make sure that you have your results validated. Next, let's look at some variations of blue. Uh, first of all is Roach. Roach is a sweet modification of blue that uh, in addition to looking at precision that blue already looks at, it, only it also takes recall into consideration. For example, it basically, oh, I think the is stuck. Okay, it comes back, the internet problem. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Okay, so it also takes recall into consideration. Uh, we follow the same, idea, uh, same methodology and compute recall and precision at the same time. And with recall and precision at hand, we can compute Roach uh, F1 score. So Roach provides a more holistic way by looking at more elements uh, compared to blue. And the second variation is material. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. Please correct me if I'm not material. But anyways, this is the spelling. Uh, additional to, in addition to the blue steps, include some additional steps. For example, uh, you consider synony synonyms, blue does not consider. So that kind of solved the problem of uh, one and an got penalized. And it also compares word stem. For example, running and runs will not be considered match, but will be considered match by Meteor. So we have, we have had enough uh, information on the natural language generation or natural language processing scores. And we would like to quickly turn our uh, gear to look at some classification metric. I believe you guys already are really familiar with classification metric because F1 scores, AOC, RPC are so commonly used. Uh, so instead of diving into that uh, level of details, introducing them again, uh, we would like to focus on comparing them and try to summarize uh, the scenarios in which you should use particularly one of them instead of just blindly applying uh, anything you have at hand. So here is a chart that I summarized the main differences between these three kinds of metrics. Uh, for example, accuracy will, the comparison between accuracy and F F1 score mainly lies in the imbalanced data. Uh, why is that? Let's take a quick look at a example. Suppose that in a scenario, you have 100 people and 95 of them is healthy and five of them has a disease. And you have a model that blindly predicts like no disease for all of the people. Then if you are doing evaluating using accuracy for this model, then you, the accuracy will say, oh, you, you achieve 95%. However, that's not really useful because you know the model does not provide you with any information that is helpful because it always predicts one label. However, if you consider F1 score, by applying the following formula, F1 score actually gave you zero. So that makes more sense to use because indeed it's not a good model. And uh, the comparison between accuracy and rock AUC lies with whether you have insights at all threshold at the same time. As you know, uh, accuracy usually takes in a threshold. For example, when you have a probability output, we set sometimes the threshold at 0 0.5 and any probability above 0 0.5 will be considered a positive label and below 0 0.5 will be considered a negative label. And notice that we can only look at accuracy at one threshold at one time. 
this makes a difference when we look at AUC. So consider, let's consider the following scenario. Suppose that we are doing binary classification again, and uh, we have a really small data set with labels 0, 1, 1, and 0. And we have our first model outputs a list of probabilities that lies really close to 0 0.5, but still predicts correctly. For example, 0 0.49 will give a prediction of 0 if we consider a threshold at 0 0.5, and 0 0.51 is greater than 0 0.5, so it will still correctly predict 1. And let's again consider a model 2 outputs. Uh, compare, instead of all predict producing probabilities around 0 0.5, it's much more confident in producing its predictions. For negative labels, is really confident in saying, oh, it's just so negative that I will give it a probability of 0 0.01. For positive labels, it's also confidence, for example, 0 0.98. So at threshold at 0 0.5, as we introduce, both model one and model two can predict very accurately and achieve an accuracy of one. But what will happen if we change prediction threshold to 0 0.9? So let's take another look at the model one. At the threshold of 0 0.9, it will predict 0 for the first output, 0, 0, and 0 for all of the four. But only two of the zeros are correct. It missed out two positive labels. But for model two, but for model two, uh, all, the predictions for the two positive labels still lie way above 0 0.9. It's still very confident. So it actually achieves an accuracy of one unchanged. So from this example, we can see that with only accuracy at a certain threshold, it only provides a limited facet of our whole picture. But by looking at the mm, proportional successes at all threshold uh, at the same time, AUC is able to provide a more holistic picture of the evaluation of the model um, at once. So when you do care about the more, how to say, holistic performance instead of uh, when you have very specific goal of, oh, I'm only interested in when the model performs at uh, threshold 0.8, for example. When you do not have that determination, probably AUC is a much better choice. So uh, that concludes the last snack of um, model evaluation after the feast provided by Elaine. And hopefully that's helpful. Uh, either as new materials or as a review. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elaine and Shaoli for a wonderful presentation.